If you're blowing up the negative balloon, it's going to be 70 times as powerful if you didn't give it life. And you also can take the air out of a balloon. If you're going to be a client of mine, like these two, Kevin and Alan, come to the call for 15 minutes prepared. You can get so much out of it. Watch how these guys are ready to go. They rapid fire me. They get me going. I'm channeling. They question what I mean. Watch how and what being more interested than interesting means on this coaching call. This is a live coaching call. These guys are not afraid to illuminate who they are and want to share their questions and answers with everyone. So number one, I'm just so grateful that you guys are my clients. I'm so excited that we get to do this every, every, every other week and I get more out of it than you guys. So <laughs> we appreciate you. Dave. This is amazing. And we're, we're so grateful for the opportunity every, every time we get the chat. Sweet. Let's, go. Let's show them how it's done boys. All right. So number one, I saw one of your posts where you were talking about taking energy away from problem. Can you go into what that actually means? Because I was mind blown when I heard that. Yeah. So, so many people give energy to a problem, right? And so what they do is they go ahead and what you pay attention to, put intention to gives it power. Trevor Moad was on the phone today with me and he talked about when you, when you put air, when you speak something to be, to, to be true, I call it balloons, right? If you're blowing up the negative balloon, it's going to be 70 times as powerful if you didn't give it life. And you also can take the air out of a balloon. Right. So a lot of today is I've been talking about speaking things into existence, giving energy to the right things. You also can take the energy out of the wrong things through understanding and happiness. And so what I utilize is when somebody has an attacking thought to me, someone has an attacking thought. I'm going to read something to you real quick. <laughs> this is it. So a sense of threat is an acknowledgement of an inherent weakness, a belief that there is a danger which has power to call on you to make an appropriate defense. The world is based on the insane belief, on this insane belief, and all its structures, all its thoughts and doubts, its penalties and heavy armaments, its legal definitions and its codes, its ethics and its leaders and its gods, all serve but to preserve this sense of threat. For no one walks the world in armature, but must have the terror striking at his heart to forgive, we need to understand and pray for somebody's happiness to take all the air out of the negative balloon. And you can do this. Nobody comes armed. There are no weapons formed against me. That's why no weapons formed against me will succeed because all I have to do is take the air out of it with understanding and love or happiness. So Dave, that leads me to a question that I wanted to ask you. So I was listening to a Bob Proctor speech recently and he said, if you want to get anything, get understanding. And so that's what we're trying to do on this call right now. And so one of my questions was, what do you believe if you had known earlier? So in your past life, you mentioned pain as a signal that something needs to change either in your perception or your behavior. What's one belief or one understanding or one lack of understanding rather? What's one lack of understanding that caused you the most pain in your life and why? My, my lack of understanding of ego. And it's, it still is like the more I peel the onion of the ego of how I create interference, corrosion to this. Un I, I just had a little taste of the light, the love and the lessons, the extraordinary power of what walks with me all the time, what is inside of me all the time. And I do not understand. I don't know the capability that I have because I am just peeling the onion, the outer layer of the onion of the ego, right? That edges goodness out of my life. I, I'm looking at my life going, I am so limited by my belief of the ego and not understanding what's creating the corrosion and interference, what I'm already walking with. I'm just getting a glimpse, you know, a glimpse of this extraordinary power. And now it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't have a clue how to harness all this and not only harness it to me, but through me for other people. When I came up with the idea to empower over a billion people, even the limitations in my mind were like, ah, uh, people think you're crazy. You know, who do you think you are? No, no, no. I have the power. I have the power and the plan, and it's greater than I can even consider what all of us can do because you're one of my 1,000 that will empower 1,000 to empower 1,000. So the ego absolutely is what I'm trying to explore to understand how do I clear that connection to what I know I'm connected to. 
I want to piggyback on the thousand that's going to impact a thousand. So we've talked about this in other calls, building ambassadors. So from your perspective, what exactly is an ambassador and how do you work somebody from maybe just a listener or a consumer of your content to an ambassador? Right. So there's followers, right? There's watchers, viewers, impressions, whatever the, the details are. Those, you know, I watch stuff, right? I watch stuff. I'm entertained. I, my wife sometimes turns a little TikTok thing to me and I'll watch 10 dancing bears, you know, whatever they are and their kids. And you know what? My heart sings for a second, but it, it's not inspiring me to go make a change. It's not inspiring me to go try to inspire somebody else in spirit, to connect emotionally, to expand and accelerate and grow, not only myself, but teach somebody else to expand, accelerate and grow. And I take it a step further, right? Because to get to a billion people, not only do I have to expand and accelerate and grow you and teach you how to do it to someone else, right? but I need you to teach someone else how to do it to someone else. So a thousand times a thousand is a million, a million times a thousand is a billion. And so an ambassador to me is someone that not only can empower somebody with your ideas, but empower that person to teach somebody else to do it well and give us the exponential value and true, I mean, unbelievable change in acceleration that can occur. So an ambassador, I only set my goal, you know, originally to two ambassadors a year that'll get me two to get me two. And I had a segmentation of 20 years in order to effectuate 2 million people getting me 2 million people in that same direction, which very quickly gets me up to a billion. Take a penny, take it to a segment of 20 and watch how much money you have. Imagine if we could do that with happiness. How do you know who to invest in? Like, obviously you've invested a lot of time in us. You, you don't, you, 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 I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I'm planting seeds under trees. I'll never ever sit under and I'm planting, I'm planting, I'm watering seeds under trees that I believe will bear fruit. And I'm picking the fruit off of others that already are growing. I'm harvesting other people. But the thing is I'm a math guy. Right. right? Why, why won't, if I have the capability that's synergistic and supplementary to watering to growing and harvesting. Why would I water, grow, and harvest as many seeds, trees, and, and fruits that I can? You guys aren't fruits, maybe, but I don't care. I love you <laughs> either way. But you see what I'm saying? Let's yeah. plant those seeds and let's grow those trees and let's pick the fruit and let's all prosper. Let's all harvest, not just today, not just tomorrow, but far in the future under trees that I'll never sit under. So, I was having a conversation with my girlfriend last weekend and we were talking about the difference between the differences she's seeing in our industry of podcasting and personal development to her industry of real estate. And the fundamental principle of there's only so much land and things are limited, I think is rooted in a in an industry that she's in. And she she notices the difference of like, I basically told her, Kevin and I believe in abundance. We believe in your winning is our winning and our winning is your winning. And so not only are you seeing an industry, personal development, that's in far more large in part predicated on that belief, but you're seeing a sub-segment of what we've attracted into our life. And we, we kind of try not to surround ourselves with people who have that you have to lose for me to win mindset. Why do you believe so many people carry around this false notion that someone else winning is not them winning too? Because I think giving is trading. Right. And so when you're living in a finite world, one of the biggest problems that people have in perception is the infinite. Right. We have a really difficult time to think about a world of more than enough of everything for everyone. We have a really difficult time of thinking of infinity of space. Right. Mm -hmm. Like we have scientific proof of galaxies and quarks. And, you know, you, you can what, what bothers the mind is whether you look through a telescope or a microscope, we don't know which view is the grander, right? It's infinity. And so because we can't put our head around the uncertainty, which absolutely is an issue for today of how people are handling a compressed uncertainty, what we decide to do is put a man-made construct on things, time, money, space, inches, feet, right? Because then we can feel comfortable. But the problem is what it does is create what you're talking about. If I take an inch, right, I gave up an inch, right? Or they gave up an inch. There's a, But in the world of infinity, if you take a mile, does it matter? No. But if there's only 10 miles, it matters. And right. so 
we can't put the man-made constructs. We have to have something called faith. And we have to be able to, because we live on this man-made construct, the earth, we live here in a man-made vibration. We have to be able to blend our faith, the aggregate of what we think, say, do, and believe, and the quantum being that we are, this unbelievable frequency, soul, or whatever you want to call it. And we have to be able to blend it. And the better the people can blend it, that's where you come up with the great expansive ideas it comes up with the van goghs of the world who imagine what they paint and then they paint what they imagine the bezos is the bransons you know the elon musk the the warren buffets of the world that see things the gates of the world that even the jobs right that can just imagine things that have never been done before at a capacity and a limitation that's never been seen mm. okay. absolute fire so just to clarify really quickly a zero-sum game is poker. In order for me to win, you have to lose. And an abundance game means that everybody wins as long as someone in the game is winning. And you believe the universe is set up that way. No doubt. The right. universe is infinite. So if anything's infinite, everybody wins. And not only infinite, but it's connected. Right? right. This is another difficulty that we have is that I myself, who's a student of this and also a teacher, I can't even fathom, you asked me earlier, what my connection to the infinite is. Like, right, because my ego is stopping me from the, the terror of knowing how actually powerful I am and how powerful I can liberate my light to liberate other people's light. But beyond how connected over here that difficulty is, I also have fear on the other side of what I am connected to, right? If I'm connected to the infinite on this side, drawing from the infinite, right? I'm connected to the infinite. It's the microscope telescope problem. And I get afraid on both sides that I'm not capable of handling the capacity of the infinite, of the infinite. Ah, powerful. So powerful. Dave, can you walk us through finding and adjusting the frequency of your brand? I saw a piece on that today and it blew my mind because I didn't think of it that way. Yeah. I've been working a lot with not only my frequency, but sub frequencies. Um, there's three things that I look at. One is the power of my signal and power of my signal comes from practice. Uh, it comes from practice in understanding what that powerful signal is. And it stems from the fact that people can only be aware of that which vibrates equal to or less than them. If my frequency is higher, I can hit more radio stations, right? So it has a, 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 a more powerful signal. I can go not only through California, but up the coast into Oregon and into Washington and into Canada, maybe around the world someday. That's a powerful signal. But that powerful signal is, is like a muscle. You, you just can't walk up to a bench press unless you're Bo Jackson and bench 435. Right. He's the only one I've ever seen to do. It takes years to get that strong. Same thing with your frequency. You've got to practice it. You've got to feel what you're saying. It has to get closer and closer to the truth to elevate his frequency. Then the more easy one is the spectrum. Right. People get lost in the size and scope and scale of the Kardashian problem. The Kardashian problem is the lowest frequency, the train wreck frequency, the negative energy frequency, you know, where you could start and, you know, do what Kim Kardashian did to build her frequency. That resonates with a lot of people, right? Because everybody likes to watch the Tiger King train wreck, the exotic Joes of the world, the Kardashians. When you try to inspire people, you have to very, very be very selective of what your spectrum is. Right? Know your spectrum. What pool of people are we looking at that we can tell the right stories with the right strength of the signal in order to inspire them, to inspire others, to inspire others? And I take it down to the level, the capacity of the reach that we have of 4.2 billion people and growing. And someone said it was 105% up. Maybe it's 8 billion people on the internet right now. Who knows? But more importantly, you know, geez, if you're an expert at cutting fingernails, you literally can have 5 million people a day taking your tips on how to cut fingernails. That is a certain frequency and a certain spectrum, but it doesn't work unless you have the third component, which also takes practice, enjoying the consistent, persistent pursuit of your potential. Clarity, right? Clar clar clarity comes from understanding how strong my signal is, what spectrum and who am I speaking to, and will they understand what we're talking about? If you saw my interview with Deepak Chopra, I got very selfish in that interview because I talked about, you know, you don't get that opportunity that often. And so I took the opportunity to ask questions at a much higher frequency. And I think a lot of people that watched it probably were like, what the heck are they talking about? That was not a good example of how to be clear. Right. Mm. It not, you know, if I can say, you know, hey, 
Deepak, do you think it's important to say thank you before you go to bed? More people would have understood what he said, but I had to take advantage of selfishly to get in the wisdom out of existence, you know, at a high, high vibration that hopefully I can learn from transcode and then send out to a lower frequency. And it's not a value of being inferior or superior. It's just a matter of being strong, spectrum related and clear in your message of who you want the audience to be. There's no judgments or conditions whether you understood an interview or not. It's a, just a matter of frequency. Mm, super powerful. So one of the questions that just came up is when do you personally know when it's time to be selfish in that moment to master your craft and understand at a higher level to then bring that in your frequency and to perfect your craft that way versus when it's time for the listeners or, or so to speak? Like how are you how are you doing that delicate dance? I'd be more interested than interesting. So when I know uh, my guests or I know the counterpart associates, employees, family member, who I'm communicating with, if I feel that I can utilize uh, a frequency to explain, you know, if I'm on the on the phone with a middle linebacker for the Baltimore Ravens, who I know has a certain frequency, an extraordinary powerful frequency, Ray Lewis, by the way, right? I, I'm going to do that interview so that we can help as many people as possible. Right. When I was on with Deepak Chopra, I made a conscious decision by being more in knowing where Deepak and saying, you know what, I can use this opportunity that I very rarely would get to, to talk to someone at such a high frequency and awareness that hopefully that I can expand my awareness and mind that I can transcode it down and help everybody by utilizing this methodology of asking the questions in the manner that you suggest, Alan. So it's very conscious, it's strategic, and it is comes from doing my homework and being more interested than interesting and saying, hey, this person knows about the echo chamber of yes. I'm going to nail into the echo chamber of yes because this is a really good spectrum that people need to hear because I was a victim, a self accountable victim of surrounding myself with the wrong people and the wrong ideas, people that only told me yes. Mm. And so how do you know personally that someone like Deepak, I, cause I remember you mentioned to us a while back. Oh, sorry, Kev. I'll, I'll let you yeah, go. Right right. My last one. So a while back you had mentioned that I think you were interviewing someone extremely high up at like either Intel or IBM. And I think they worked on Watson maybe. Yeah. Um, and you said you were selfish and you really wanted to pick their brain about AI and robotics and stuff like that. How do you know, when it's time, like, how do you know that Deepak's awareness is higher than yours, so to speak? Because isn't that a judgment call on some level? So what's your, what's your criteria? Well, so understanding a frequency, right? So I can only be aware of that which vibrates equal to or less than me. So when I watch or listen pre previous to having the discussion to the rocket scientist or, you know, the enge engineer, the, you know, physicist of the, IBM Watson, uh, and I'm doing my due diligence, I'm being more interested, or of course, reading Deepak's books and watching him and listening to him. There's so many things that I'm not aware of, right? Where there's other people that I can listen to, right? If I watch Bob Mennery and watch him do, and I'm a big fan of his and love what he does, I know that I have a relative awareness of understanding what's going on. So I can communicate and ask questions to be entertaining and to draw from what he does. But when I listen to those other people, I wasn't quite sure what was all going on. And I had, like when I talk with you guys, you guys have a ton of questions, which means I can elevate your awareness to what do you mean by this, or right? And so those are the opportunities for me to say, hey, this person's vibrating faster than I am. No judgment or condition. He's not superior and inferior, but I'm connected to him. I'm I'm a part of him. I want to elevate my vibration so that I know what he's talking about. How does that affect your your like listener base or your avatar of people that are following you? So is it your job to deliver the message at a lower level or are they going to catch up and follow you? We got to do both, right? So look, I put some stuff up there and it drives me crazy sometimes that I absolutely love, right? I put out a lot of content, as you guys know, I got 95% more content I can put up there. But even Justin and I will put up stuff that we ab absolutely love and nobody will really get in our spectrum, right? In, in the millions of people that watch, which is in a tiny, minute spectrum of who we could be reaching, none of none of them really get it. And then, you know, somebody will put up a silly, you know, cartoon or my daughter will do a video on her cell phone 
and it'll get the most views ever, the most comments ever. And I'm sitting there going, I study every single day, every single day of my life for the last 14 years from 5.30 to 6.30 and from 7.30 to 9 p.m. Seven days a week, studying, either studying my calendar, researching for books, guests, being more interested, sucking up knowledge. And my you know, 18-year-old daughter can come in my closet and do a <laughs> silly, silly video on the phone and it resonates with more people. And all I know is that the reason it resonates is because she has it at a better frequency, the frequency that more people are tuned into than Dave Meltzer talking to Deepak Chopra, especially mm -hmm. on Instagram, right? I, if I take it somewhere else, if I took it to the courseinmiracles.org, 100% of those people will be like, oh my God, this is wonderful. But unfortunately, there's not 4.2 billion people. I'd only be hitting 1,100. Okay. Do you decipher the difference between those 1,100? Because your goal is to lead leaders, to empower others, to empower others, to be happy. So in terms of the mathematics of it, if you're leading influencers and leading leaders, that, that positive impact will scale faster, correct? What's your thinking behind that in terms of your strategic decision-making? I'm, I'm still planting seeds, watering trees, picking fruits, right? So those are the trees that have already developed. I'm harvesting those soup, those more mature trees. Right. But for me, it's just a consistent, persistent pursuit of my potential to do all of them because I don't put value on harvesting over planting. Right. I, I, I don't. And so I like to do it all and the numbers fall where they fall, you know, and I just want to make sure that I'm addressing each and every one of those spectrums that I want to empower, not just for today. Right. It's nice to harvest fruit for today, but I love planting seeds for trees I never will sit under in my lifetime. Mm, powerful. Do you have another one, Kev, or do you mind if I... You can you can go. What do we got for time here? Our hour pays more. <laughs> <laughs> I have one question. This will be my last one, then Kevin can go. So I have this written down. If you could snap your fingers and change the existing American education system, what would you change about it specifically if you could only change one thing and why? I take the education out of it and it'd be socialization. So... For me, we, we need those institutions. Uh, I, I love the networking, the sorority, the EO. Someone said emotional intelligence. I forget where that was. Um, but I'd extract the actual education out of it, right? So if kids are coming there to play football, look, let them play football. And then give them the education in the most effective way with the best educators, meaning people that sit in the situation that they want to be in. So we're going to see this happen, right? Forbes University is hiring people like Dave Meltzer to teach entrepreneurship, where you can come online, watch a video that's either live or recorded, have a Q&A session with Dave Meltzer. Look, that's good. So let's section off the time. Let's make sure they have internet connection, but let's allow them for three, two, three or four years to socialize. You know, I prefer, you know, to have two years where they're socializing by giving back and learning and mentoring and, you know, maybe work, working our parks and, and volunteering for the old, older people or younger people, like real experience. And then having a section of the day consistently seven days a week where you're picking and choosing the classes from the biggest leaders in the world that have made themselves available. I'd rather my daughter be online learning the moon and sun meditation than sitting in a class that she's not paying attention to because there's under some falsehood of being at college. I'd rather her be at the parties at the sorority, at the football games, interacting, learning how to connect to people and motivate and inspire. So I think we have to maintain the social, economic, fun, all that stuff of, of being in college. We need to give back more and have a program where we're giving back uh, to the communities during that period of time, some sort of mentorship or internship for free that they're giving back, cleaning up roads, doing good deeds. And then specifically, we need to train people and educate them to what they want. And if they want to be the greatest salon owner, then let's have a salon owner class and bring up the best salon owner. I'm cool with that, but let's educate people on stuff that they can use because trigonometry, you know, I, I'm not joking. My, you got your brain's a muscle. So I talked to my daughters about learning a language and I said, there's not, unless you want to practice the muscle of learning a new language, it has to be the dumbest thing that you can do practically. Because if you don't realize that every phone in the world within a few years, if not a year, will be able to translate your voice exactly as it sounds into 90 different languages perfectly, right? It's just like a calculator, right? We're not, we're not doing math anymore. Let's get real. Let's 
teach people things that are going to be productive, accessible, and gracious in their manner to help expand and accelerate the world to a better place. Let's not stick into some old, you know, thing. That, you ever see that uh, thinking? The, the 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 kid asks his grandma. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. A kid grows up and he gets married and he cuts off the t uh, the, the the on a stake. He cuts off the uh, two inches on one side and two inches on the other. And his spouse is like, why do you cut off two inches, uh, you know, of the sirloin, you know, on each side? What, what is that? He's like, I, I just learned from my grandma. You know, that's how you're supposed to cook the steak. And so they went to grandma's house and he asked his grandma, why do you cut the two inches off of each side of the steak? She goes, because I didn't have a pan big enough. Right. That's what our education system's doing right? We're, we're doing stuff because the pan wasn't big enough. We got a huge pan now. Let's eat the whole goddamn steak. <laughs> that was fire.